Hey, everybody. How's everybody doing tonight? Can you hear me okay? Hopefully. So, appreciate everybody joining tonight. Uh, this is, uh, well, first of all, my name's uh, Rich Horgan and I uh, started Cure Rare Disease. Thanks, Monica. It's uh, it's it's funny because I, uh, I, I can't hear anybody, so it's like I'm just talking to myself, but uh, thanks for letting me know you're there and can hear me okay. Um, so yeah, I appreciate, appreciate everybody joining tonight. Uh, my name's Rich Horgan and I uh, founded Cure Rare Disease a couple of years back. And we've, uh, we uh, have centered our mission around developing uh, customized therapeutics using CRISPR technology, which I'll get into in a bit, uh, to treat uh, genetic diseases that really have no treatment. Um, some some sort of uh, interesting statistics just to start off is that there's over 7,000 rare diseases and uh, they affect over 30 million Americans, believe it or not. Um, and of those diseases, unfortunately, only 5% have effective treatments or cures. And so uh, we're here for the 95%. And that's what brings us here tonight. And that's what the cause of rare disease is and was and uh, will be until we tackle all of those diseases. And so tonight I, I thought I would just go over a, a high level overview of what we're doing at Cure Rare Disease. Uh, one of our, our missions is to be super transparent about what we're doing, our research, our goals, our visions, um, to make sure that, that we communicate with people. Um, uh, just a little bit of background uh, about me real quick is that I grew up in upstate New York, um, I have a younger brother, Terry, and he's the reason behind cure disease here. And uh, Terry is impacted by a disease called Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Now, uh, judging by some of the names on the uh, on, on the chat wall there, I think uh, some are here for Duchenne and others are, are here for more, more uh, broadly rare disease in general. Um, but nonetheless, I think the shared frustration of individuals uh, of not having access to treatments, of, of research moving so painfully slow, uh, is, is something we can all connect with and something that we all we all can understand. And so um, this will be about an hour tonight. Um, I do want to leave time for Q&A, so I'll try to move through the presentation. Um, if you have questions along the way, try to shout them out. Uh, the way this is sort of set up for me is the presentation's most of the screen, and then I can see the chat bar on the side. Um, if, if there's any point at which the sound goes bad or something, you know, just shout out um, to me. I, I, I don't hear any feedback on this end, so just let me know. And, um, you know, don't don't be afraid to ask questions. I think um, that that's that's how I got started, uh, just asking a lot of questions and, and uh, trying to learn more. And uh, so I encourage everybody to do that. <clears throat> so I can figure out how to change this. Okay, so the, the uh, agenda. Um, Want to cover tonight just a brief overview of the DMD drug, uh, of what's going on, sort of, and using Duchenne uh, muscular dystrophy as an example. Um, I think Duchenne is a good example because it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a very difficult disease to, to, to tackle. Um, all diseases are uh, brutal. Uh, but Duchenne's proved extremely challenging, and um, so I want to I want to set that example up just to just to set the context of rare disease, and then move into our approach and how CRISPR works and and what we're doing, you know, who we're surrounded ourselves with, and uh, how you can get involved as well. Um, you know, one of the nicest things about this um, organization is I've had the pleasure to work with people from all sorts of walks of life. Um, you know, a big a big shout out to the folks that work, uh, the few of us that work at Cure Rare Disease. Uh, Kirsten, Rachel, and, and our three great interns this summer, uh, Walker, Malika, and Melissa, uh, and our board. Uh, we'll get to see them in a bit, but fortunate for everybody who's, who's uh, surrounded themselves with uh, what we're doing here. So we got started because of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Now, not everybody will resonate with that, but I think what, as I mentioned, everybody will resonate with the fact that there is a disease with no treatment, whether that's Duchenne, whether that's cystic fibrosis, whether that's uh, any number of the other uh, many, many diseases that are out there. Um, the the genesis, uh, the catalyst behind this was the fact that for us, uh, my family was touched by something for which we were told um, there's no treatment and, you know, go home and, and, and love your brother, in my case, and that's all you can do. Uh, Max, uh, a little guy who's four years old down there, this picture you can see, uh, his family got the same message, and thousands of other families get the same message, and that's frustrating. <clears throat> Duchenne's expensive, like many rare diseases, and life expectancy isn't particularly happy. Um, it's a it's a tough disease, uh, and uh, just for those who may not be familiar, uh, it's a muscle wasting disease 
uh, caused by a mutation in a protein called, or in a gene called dystrophin. And it essentially leads to uh, continuous muscle breakdown. And with the rapid muscle breakdown causes um, significant increases in scar tissue. And eventually it's, it, it replaces any, any muscle. And so um, that's what we're trying to fix. Firstly, at Pure Disease, uh, to set an example of, of how we could use customized therapeutics to treat uh, not just Duchenne, but many other diseases, um, to, to use it as a template for society to, to try and do the same thing. Um, and and uh, we know we need a lot of help there. Uh, so traditional drug development uh, is geared towards treating populations, not individuals. Um, that's not to say that traditional drug development isn't needed. In fact, it's uh, needed more than ever. And what we're trying to do at Cure Rare Disease is to try to develop a new toolkit that can be added to humanity's, ars humanity's arsenal in fighting rare diseases, in fighting multiple diseases. Um, and so you know, I think for, for those who have been impacted by a disease, I think you're all too familiar with this process that I'm showing you on the screen here. Um, it takes a long time to de develop a drug. And the challenge is, is that uh, with, with many diseases, there's not a one size fits all solution. There's not a, a, a one lock into which one key can fix many patients. Oftentimes patients, as, as every individual, uh, are unique and their mutations can be unique as well. Uh, within Duchenne, we'll see the same mutation impact two boys. The disease only affects boys uh, primarily. There is very rare cases of, of girls being infected. And we'll see two totally different outcomes. And so it begs the question, uh, can we try to approach treating diseases differently? Can we try to approach treating diseases uh, instead of the disease, but the individual? And, and how can we do that? And so we asked ourselves, uh, can we, if my slide's your turn, uh, could we speed the development of drugs uh, to patients who need them desperately? Uh, my brother being one of those patients. Um, I think on the last slide, you saw that the average drug development is, is, is debatable. Uh, um, some numbers cite 10 years and $2 billion. Um, I can tell you that in my situation, and I'm sure many of you feel this way, uh, that I neither had 10 years nor $2 billion to do this. And so how, how can we do something different? How can we get something faster to patients? And so that's where Cure Rare Disease was born. Uh, Cure Rare Disease is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, we identify ourselves as a nonprofit biotechnology company, and we develop drugs through our partnerships. Uh, similar to, to uh, biotech companies you may be familiar with, uh, we partner with a lot of well, a lot of different organizations, leading researchers and scientists across the world. And I have the honor of working with uh, individuals at each of these locations. And they all play a different role. But the important part is that they're all connected and they're all speaking and they're all collaborating. And that breaking down of barriers, a breaking down of silos, at least as we have seen so far, to be able to expedite and speed effective research to getting it to patients. And so I can touch on these a little bit. Um, you know, if there's questions, do shout them out. Uh, but basically, this, this journey for me began at um, a couple of years ago with, with uh, some, some collaborators at Yale and University of Massachusetts and Boston Children's Hospital. And uh, standing on, this, on the shoulders of giants, as we often do, uh, there was a, a professor by the name of Tim Yu, who I'll show you on the next slide. And uh, Tim is at Boston Children's Hospital. I had an amazing story, a little girl, Amila. Uh, had a rare disease called uh, BATS, and she's still with us, fortunately, due to the work of Tim. Uh, but at the time, it wasn't so certain. And so within, back in 2017, 2018, uh, this little girl had very few months left. And Tim and his team developed uh, a drug for her based off of her mutation, uh, designed specifically for her, and dosed her, and lo and behold, uh, it helped her. And it, and it helped to elongate her life significantly. And fortunately, she and her mom, Julia, uh, two wonderful people are, are still with us. And that gave me the idea to say, well, could we do this? Could we do it on a bigger scale? Um, instead of Batten's disease, could we do it for Duchenne? Could we do it for cystic fibrosis? Could we do it for other diseases that don't have the benefit of treatments? And so that's where we began. Uh, we began with uh, my brother. Uh, he got a muscle biopsy, as, as many uh, Duchenne patients do. And using that muscle biopsy, we were able to characterize his mutation very, very deeply. Whole genome sequencing, RNA sequencing to understand the DNA activity, the RNA activity, and ultimately the protein activity of what was going on. Because if we need to design something specific for a patient, we need to make sure the target's the right target. And so from there, it expanded to Yale, who runs our discovery and continues to run our discovery. They're the ones that take the input from the muscle biopsy, analyze it and understand, okay, what can we do about this? 
And that was where we started with CRISPR activation for my brother based on his mutation. And from there, academics have the ability, the great ability to do really innovative work and, and where they excel in innovation, uh, contract research organizations like Charles River uh, excel in executing the preclinical development. And so what goes from Yale and the, the, the molecule or the, the, the biologic that was developed there with CRISPR then is now at Charles River where we're running preclinical tests. How much dose size and, and what's the safety profile of it? From there, our manufacturing partners are uh, Viralgen and Aldebaran. Uh, Viralgen produces the AAV that we'll dose with, and Aldebaran produces the plasmid. You can kind of think of the AAV as the delivery truck and the plasmid as the contents within it. Um, the delivery truck just has to get it there. The AAV just has to get it to muscle. And then the plasmid is what does the, uh, the therapeutic benefit. And ultimately, we'll dose at University of Massachusetts Medical School, Medical School with uh, Dr. Brenda Wong and the support of the institution there. So uh, it, the, the big takeaway from this slide is that it's really all about collaboration. It's, it's really about working together, uh, making sure that, that uh, we are talking, that we're knocking down silos, that we understand what's done in an earlier phase, how it feeds into later phases, because we don't want to lose things along the way. And that's, that's one thing this collaboration has particularly excelled at. And so customized therapeutics are new, uh, but fortunately we, we have uh, just a couple data points of successful track records with the FDA. Um, in just a few years ago, or actually just a few years ago, uh, an individual by the name of uh, Dr. Fagenbaum uh, repurposed an existing drug to treat his life-threatening disease, Castleman. And so that was an instance of how do we take something that's been approved and apply it to a new disease? Now in comes Dr. Yu, uh, Tim Yu, where he says, how can we take a drug, uh, Spinraza, and how can we modify that drug, which has a known safety profile, but needs to target and do something just a little bit different than treat the disease that it was developed for? How can we modify that drug and use it for, uh, in this case, Batten's disease? And so that was a, a, an example of modifying an approved drug, changing its chemistry to some degree to repurpose it for uh, a Batten's case instead of uh, SMA as Spinraza was designed for. And then now what we're trying to do is, is something slightly different. We're trying to create a new drug modality. And so what that means is that means taking, taking a drug that's not been used in humans before, uh, tested in animals, and, and applying it to a disease, Sim similar to what we're doing here, exactly what we're doing here. And so we're trying to customize the drug. Now, what we're doing, uh, to my knowledge at least, wasn't possible five years ago. The advancement of whole genome sequencing technologies, uh, understanding where the breakpoints are within a mutation, uh, being able to modify and customize the drug like we can with CRISPR or like as in Tim, as with Tim did in the case of a, uh, an oligonucleotide as Spinraza is. And so uh, we're trying to push the boundary here uh, because we need to go quicker and, and we need to have drugs that work in people and that we know they work in people. And so uh, ultimately that, that may raise the question of, you know, what is CRISPR and how does it work? And uh, I don't have a PhD, uh, I don't have an MD. Um, I've just uh, studied a lot and, and have worked with some of the best and brightest minds in the field. And so I try to boil it down to something simple because that's what I understand. And so, uh, you know, I, I think before you, we have sort of a definition of an answer, but uh, CRISPR, uh, actually the protein is called Cas9, is basically molecular scissors. It goes to a point within a gene and it's able to snip or insert uh, different things into that gene. And it's guided by sort of, if you think of uh, uh, Santa and reindeer, right? The Cas9 is Santa and a sleigh, whereas the reindeer are the guide RNA. And the guide RNA tell it where to go. There's a really great uh, graphic on our website and some videos that were done by uh, Nord, the uh, rare disease group, that uh, you can really see some in-depth inf in information on how CRISPR uh, works, how gene therapy works. I encourage you to go to that. It's uh, our website's curerarediseases.org. And it is uh, just a great learning tool for folks who want to learn more. And it's digestible as well. And so you can do a bunch of different things with CRISPR, right? CRISPR is sort of like the Swiss Army knife. Uh, you can cut out problem proteins. You can activate, as we're doing with, with my brother, uh, certain genes or upregulate certain genes. And you can also repress uh, troublesome genes. You know, imagine repressing uh, cancer, uh, a cancer-causing gene. Uh, so CRISPR is a very multifaceted tool. And certainly we won't have the time tonight get, to get into all the depths of it. Uh, but it's a complicated tool, and it's a tool that holds, holds a lot of hope for humanity. Uh, I encourage you to see some of the use cases so far of CRISPR with uh, programs like what uh, Vertex and CRISPR Therapeutics are doing, where they've treated, I believe, a couple sickle cell patients uh, with CRISPR. 
slightly different than what we're trying to do with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, uh, but uh, a good use case and a good example of a success story so far in the field of this technology. And so you might ask, why, why aren't uh, more companies doing this uh, bespoke therapeutic or individual customized therapeutic? And, and the simple answer is, is that we're designed to do this, right? We, we put together a collaboration in a way that we're designing a drug for the individual rather than trying to wrap a drug around an entire population. There's nothing inherently good or bad uh, about either of those approaches for us, given the, given the rarity of the disease and given the, given the low prevalence of, of many rare diseases, but in my brother's case, an ultra rare mutation, um, that was not an avenue that was going to, in all likelihood, be successful for, for, for my family and I and, and many others who have become involved in the organization since. And so, you know, at the beginning, I mentioned, you know, our goal is to take uh, and add a new tool to humanity's toolkit in its fight against disease. And so that's our goal here. Um, you know, we're trying to design, as it says, the custom suit of therapeutics instead of mass production, right? It's tailored to the individual. And so um, what we're looking at now is how do we scale this, right? We're seeing early success, as I'll show you in the subsequent slides, of designing CRISPR uh, customized to an individual. But now the question is, how do, we, how do we make it bigger for more people? How do we help others and how do we teach others to do the same process? Um, at the end of the day, it's patients we want to treat, right? This is a nonprofit and it was built as a nonprofit intentionally so, so that we could um, do exactly that, which was put patients um, above all else. And just encourage you if there's questions, uh, you know, don't be shy. I'm flipping back and forth in between screens here just so, so I can see them. Um, but uh, no questions, a bad question. So moving on, um, I just wanted to show what our process is. For uh, some of you who have been to our, our uh, last webinar, I think it was in January or February, um, feels like a long time ago, um, you, you've seen this slide before. And so, so as I mentioned with my brother, where we started was this characterization of the individual, genetic and molecular level characterization. This is whole genome sequencing. This is think 23 and me, but much more complex. Um, the way that sort of protein is at a high level made is that DNA is the blueprint. Um, RNA is, is what converts, uh, helps to convert the instructions into the protein, which is the ultimately the functional unit. Um, and so we need to understand uh, with my brother and, and other patients that we've now run through, uh, through this phase one, or step one, phase one, uh, what's going on with them at a very, very, very deep level because we need to understand where the target is. We need to understand, although it might be an exon 51 deletion, where's it broken on the exon? Uh, and, and where does the uh, break go through? What's happening on the transcript level? Is there any dystrophin being produced? Uh, in a couple of the cases we've seen, even though in theory there should be no dystrophin produced, uh, we in fact do see uh, trace levels of dystrophin. In my brother, for instance, when we took his muscle biopsy, we uh, found that he had about uh, a small level of dystrophin present in his bloodstream, which then informed our therapeutic strategy of how do we treat him. Um, next, and again, this is just our first patient example, so that's why it's CRISPR activation specific. Different uh, mutations require different applications of CRISPR. Remember the, the last couple slides, the few slides ago we showed, we can repress, we can activate, we can delete. Um, and so just bear that in mind as we're talking about this. And so once we sort of know uh, what's going on within the patient? We know, okay, there's a there's a uh, exon uh, duplication. We'll use a duplication example from uh, there's a duplication of 20 to 25. Okay, now we need no. Now we know we need to go in and 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 cut that out. And we know where to go and we know how to target it based on on that 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 part one of the step. And that's in leads into the next step, which is step two, uh, phase two, where we actually design the therapeutic construct. And uh, when when these are designed, many are designed. There's a whole batch that are designed and then tested. So we can start to see, okay, what's, what's effective, which combination of permutation of things works well. Um, this isn't one therapeutic agent, right? It's not just Cas9 that we inject into an AAV. Um, it's much more complicated than that. Think of it as more a uh, 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 bioengineering. And so in addition to the, to the cutting protein, we have the guide RNA. Uh, we have the, the actual package that it's delivered in. We have a muscle specific promoter because it's, it's a whole package of things that, that's designed here. And so when, when phase two, when, when different constructs are being designed, we, uh, we have a number that are designed and we see which ones work. You'll see it in a subsequent slide on, on our second patient, um, the, the number of uh, molecules, or not molecules, but the number of constructs that were designed and which were tested and which showed to be most efficacious. And once we sort of finalized and settled on one construct, you know, we think, 
it's this one. This one shows the best results in, in the patient's cell line uh, at upregulating dystrophin. And then we move to test and optimize it. Optimizing it in the therapeutic cell line, this means did we choose the right guide RNA? Can we do better? Uh, this means uh, uh, how, how much do we give? Uh, what's the safety profile of it? Uh, a big concern with any genetic therapy is what's called off-target effects. Are we turning on, are we repressing, are we activating, are we deleting um, anything that we shouldn't be deleting unintentionally? Uh, we don't, above all, we don't wanna do harm. We don't wanna cause cancer. We don't wanna turn off genes that should be on and vice versa. And so that's where we can learn a lot of this is in the patient cell line. Uh, dosing the individual cell line with the therapeutic, then we're able to do uh, these steps of, of, of RNA sequencing to understand, is there any transcript activity of, of different genes that we didn't intend to turn on? And it's really important to know that. And ultimately, uh, what that boils into is, is conversations with the FDA. Uh, at the end of this month, we'll submit what's called our pre-IND. Uh, IND stands for Investigational New Drug. And, and what that will do is, is basically show the FDA, okay, we've done all this work, we've tested it in mice, we've tested it in human cell lines, okay? And then here's our plan to the clinic. Here's the roadmap into dosing the patient. And so that involves what does the clinical trial look like? What does the manufacturing process look like? All these details that come together, and then the FDA provides you feedback and says, we like this, we like that, we don't like that, Can you, you, know, you need to change that. And so that's the step that we're approaching right there. Once you make those changes, that back and forth, it's an iterative process, then you get the approval to dose, assuming you've, you've met the satisfaction of the FDA. And, and what we're doing is since it's single patient, uh, we are able to have uh, a good degree of conversation with the FDA to say, we know this technology has not yet been systemically delivered in patients, this technology being CRISPR. Um, what are the concerns? And what we've done is we've brought together as many of the experts in, in the world, really, to uh, give us their opinion, give us their perspective, their input, their advice, because we're all working on different facets of technology. Um, but bringing those perspectives again, enabling that collaboration is something that allows us to go, oh, you know, we didn't, we didn't think of that. We need, we need, to, we need to make sure we, we dot that I and cross that T. Um, ultimately, the FDA provides the, uh, the IND approval, which is the permission to dose. And then the investigator-led uh, trial begins. And uh, in our case, our, our trial will occur, and then we'll have a period of two years of follow-up to make sure that that we're not seeing things that are concerning. Um, I'll get into some of the some of the risks of AAV later, uh, but but essentially, AAV is a virus, right? And so your immune system can react to not only the AAV virus, the Cas9 protein, uh, as well as other components. So we need to make sure it's safe. And that's the purpose and process that we go through with the FDA. Uh, and so this is a this is a timeline, uh, obviously. Uh, this is just a perspective on on when we got started. Uh, some of our our major accomplishments. We were very fortunate and I'm very grateful to uh, have Ed Curator disease appear on the Today Show last week. Uh, hopefully, some of you have seen that. Um, but but I wanted to really convey the speed that we're able to move with when developing a drug for an individual. Um, in developing a drug for just an individual is easier than in theory developing a drug for a population. Different locks require different keys. And so when we're developing a drug for an individual, it's one lock we have to worry about. But what we learn and what we do and generate knowledge for with one individual vastly informs subsequent individuals to come, which is what we're seeing now. And ultimately, uh, uh, you know, starting in, in May of 2018, uh, after after graduating, uh, we we hope to dose and are on track to dose in uh, early Q1 2020, maybe late Q4 2020 or 2021. Excuse me. So late Q4 2020 or early Q Q1 2021, um, towards the end of the year. And uh, so I, I mentioned this just a minute ago, and this is where we'll get into some of the the, the findings that we've done. Actually, before I do, let me just check if there's questions here. How do you say I'm going to get that level? Uh, so I'm just going to go. I'm just going to go up. It looks like Laura. Laura, you had a question. How do do Shen families get that level of information about the mutation? So oftentimes, when you're diagnosed, uh, you'll get a genetic report. Oftentimes, it's done through a blood test. Um, there's different levels of depth of of sequencing a mutation. Um, oftentimes. When your clinician draws blood, they'll see a high, what's called CPK level, it's creatine kinase, and that will give them an idea that um, there's there's something not right here. And oftentimes they'll 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 uh, run another test and and diagnose with Duchenne. Whole genome sequencing goes one layer deeper. 
uh, and before that layer, excuse me, uh, they'll often be what's called exome sequencing. It's a subset of genes that, that uh, researchers believe and have seen to have caused uh, disease before. So they look at the common sort of the common uh, genes, disease causing genes first. Whole genome sequencing goes one layer deeper. That interrogates an entire genome. And so um, depending on the level of depth, um, for, for what we're doing, whole genome sequencing is required and necessary. Um, and and, and we, we do that as part of the process. But um, you know, if you're just interested, if you're just trying to learn more, um, you can request whole genome sequencing from your doctor. Um, oftentimes it's not covered by insurance, so do use caution when doing it. I think it runs about $800. Um, and, and soon we'll be um, uh, wor uh, working to get uh, more folks whole genome sequenced as well, just uh, to provide uh, service to the community. Um, no, let me know if that, that answers your question, Laura. Um, I'll move on to the next one. How is UCLA involved? Uh, so so uh, Stan Nelson and uh, his lab and Richard Wang uh, have done all of our, 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 our sequencing, our RNA sequencing, our whole genome sequencing. Fantastic group to work with. But more, more importantly, beyond the execution of the sequencing that UCLA does, um, they, that we have uh, their, their knowledge and their input as collaborators, which is really great. Um, Stan Nelson and, and his team are, are fantastic researchers out there and we're, you know, we're really grateful to be able to pick their brain um, and really learn from their, their vast amount of experience. Again, coming back to collaboration. How did the mouse testing go? Can you tell us if there's any risks identified in testing? And if how so, how will you need to mitigate those risks? Yeah, great question. Um, so I'll get to that in a few slides. Um, uh, we, so our first goal was to do efficacy testing to understand is there a dose dependent response? So we didn't look for safety in this, in this setting. Um, the way that our guide RNA are chosen uh, was through the lens of do they cause any off target effects? So we tried to filter out those that may be troublesome down the road. It's our next study actually. Uh, we're doing a farm talk study that will show us um, exactly that, the safety profile. So we'll, um, we'll, look, we'll do what's called RNA sequencing on the, on the cell line. Um, that'll tell us are any genes uh, being turned on that shouldn't be turned on. Um, and then also the actual um, drug moving throughout the body of, of the experimental animals. Um, the delivery vehicle, AAV9, is relatively well known. We've seen Novartis with their SMA drug dose. Uh, Pfizer is using a microdystrophin drug uh, in their studies, or excuse me, an AAV9 in their studies. So there, there is a track record of, of knowledge about AAV, which, which helps us move faster. Um, our goal is to recreate as little of the wheel as possible so we can move quickly. Um, we don't need to, we, we don't, um, we don't want to repeat studies that we can already either cross-reference or, or, or aren't needed from the FDA. What does it mean to have a cell line established? Uh, so a cell line is, is basically a patient in a dish. Um, depending on the disease, it can be neuron, uh, neuro, uh, neurons, cardio, cardiomyocytes, heart cells, uh, muscle cells. And so for Duchenne, we, we take muscle and we do what's called immortalizing the cell line. So it expands out, you grow it, um, and we can then test different the therapeutic in sort of a dish of the patient's cells. Uh, rather than, obviously, you're not going to go into a patient without an approved drug. So um, it gives us a better glimpse in the box, so to speak. And, and uh, research, research labs do this. So ours was done at the University of Massachusetts by uh, Charlie Emerson. Uh, he's, he's a great uh, uh, principal investigator at UMass, and uh, he, he's established all of our cell lines. Uh, so how does one get whole genome sequenced? Uh, I think I answered that, but uh, you, you do it through your doctor, or you can go through if you want to pay out of pocket. Um, companies like uh, Illumina. Um, highly encourage you though, to have all these conversations with your doctor. This is just my perspective. You know, I certainly don't encourage anybody to run off and start whole genome sequencing. Uh, it's low, generally low, low risk. It's uh, you can either extract DNA from saliva or blood, a uh, blood draw. Pretty routine. Uh, but consult with your doctor on all this. You know, this is this is um, you know not encouraging folks to go in mass to get whole genome sequenced. Uh, was or will there be a large animal study? Uh, so, so the way we're going for for my brother is through uh, compassion. Who's this? Terry. Uh, Terry is through compassionate care uh, I, uh, regulatory pathway, and so um, we're we're not proposing a large animal study for this because we don't think it'll tell us much. Um, and the reason for that is because it's a genetic therapy that, that's human specific. So they're human guide RNA, which aren't going to do anything in a dog uh, or a chimp. Um, what, what tests like those do tell you is how it's called ADME, absorption, metabolism, uh, digestion, and excretion. It tells you how it passes through uh, the animal. Does it, does it uh, trigger their liver or does it trigger their uh, kidneys into uh, some sort of renal failure? Um, those types of studies uh, are, are helpful 
to get information like that from. But for us, since this is a human specific therapy, it would be um, not hugely productive to, to inject the therapeutic into, into a dog or a primate. Larger studies generally have to do that, but we're, we're, we're fortunate to not, uh, likely not have to do that um, with, with this study. And I say likely because we haven't gotten that feedback from the FDA yet. So, so we'll see is the question. Um, the, the, the goal here since Terry is, you know, we, we need to move quickly, uh, but safely uh, is to balance between those two. Why the IND route? Uh, well, you need an IND to, yeah, whether it's compassionate care or, 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 or just regular drug development, um, you need an IND as permission to dose a, a patient, a human being with an experimental therapeutic. Um, and so we, above all, we want to, we want to make sure that we, uh, do as much diligence and as much development as necessary. And so uh, the FDA is, is the ultimate gatekeeper in the U S for, for approving experimental therapeutics for experimental human dosing. And so on um, the IND is the, is the stamp that allows us to proceed. So let me get back to the slides here. Um, so where was I? Uh, so yes. So again, this is just the example of the first patient, um, my brother, and uh, I'll show you some some findings from from our second patient as well. But in terms of where we are today uh, with the first patient, we've we've just wrapped up our exploratory uh, PD study. It's a pharmacodynamic study, uh, basically seeing when injecting the drug, what does it do to the mice? It gives us an idea how much of the drug to give, and so that's really important. Our next study that we're, we're we'll be doing is called a farm talk study, and that's so that's somewhat of a combination between an efficacy study, seeing again in more mice, uh, greater volumes. Do we get the same result, uh, which we're which we're hoping to see? And then what's the safety of, of the drug? So we we talked about this a couple minutes ago. Um, how does the drug metabolize through through the animals? Um, how does it in the human cell line? Because remember, this is human specific. This uh, is not is not mouse specific um, or dog specific because the guide RNA are, are uh, unique to humans. Um, there will be different uh, guide RNA in mice and dogs. Um, are there any off-target effects? Again, do we turn on anything we don't want to turn on? Above all, do no harm is, is really the first tenant. And so, uh, as I mentioned, that's ultimately boiling up into us submitting um, our pre-IND at the end of the month. The FDA provides feedback. We'll take that feedback in the, into, into heart and implement it into our, our final study, which is the study, the farm talk study I just mentioned. Once that farm talk study ends, you pull all this information together into what's called your IND. It sort of builds on the pre-IND. You keep adding to it. It's an iterative process. And then you submit that to the FDA. Uh, 30 days, uh, I believe, goes by. And then you're, you're either given the thumbs up or the thumbs down. And that leads into uh, this investigator-led uh, trial. Uh, administration, really, since there's, there's no placebo, since it's into, uh, customized to an individual, it wouldn't make sense to have a placebo. Um, Moving on, so just a little bit of uh, insight into into what we're seeing so far. So this was completed uh, back in uh, spring 2019. So uh, back in spring 2019, we'd, we'd since taken a muscle biopsy from my brother, uh, developed a number of constructs using CRISPR activation that could upregulate, in his case, the alternative uh, dystrophin gene. Uh, it's just an alternative isoform. Instead of the muscle isoform of the gene, it's the uh, cortical isoform of the gene. And again, we were informed by that and that therapeutic strategy was laid out um, by the fact that we um, had taken that muscle biopsy and analyzed it and understood what's going on there. So we saw great results. We saw this significant upregulation in that bottom one there, which is what we wanted to see, that DP427C, that's dystrophin uh, cortical isoform, that's where the C comes from. And that was great. That gave us a lot of confidence that you know we were onto something promising. And many months were spent after that, that um, optimizing the therapeutic, choosing uh, the best guide RNA, choosing uh, the the right promoter, the the right muscle specific promoter. So fine tuning everything as good as we could get it. Um, in addition, in addition to our cells. Now cells are one thing, right? Cells are sort of in exactly that individual cells. They aren't um, an organism, and therapeutics function differently in an organism than they do on the cellular level. And so that's why it was important for us to uh, move on to uh, testing in in mice. And so what we did here is this is not just a mouse. Um, this is a humanized Duch uh, Duchenne mouse. And what does that mean? Uh, that means that this mouse has a human dystrophin gene inserted with all the introns, the flanking regions, as close to human as we can get that gene inserted into that mouse. And then it has a mutated mouse gene. So we've tried to eliminate the mouse dystrophin and have the human dystrophin. And, 
And what that allows is that allows those human specific guide RNAs, which are going to target that exon one of the human dystrophin gene to have an effect. And so with this, uh, this, these are, this is fresh off, the, fresh off the press as of last week, um, and we're still waiting on the wait, eight-week arm. But what we did um, in terms of study design is we took uh, two doses uh, of the therapeutic. This is informed by uh, what we've seen in some other cases, like microdystrophin, uh, sort of powering it to 2 point something times 10 to the 14th or 10 to the 13th to give us a dose range, um, injected uh, multiple groups of mice, and then waited uh, some groups were four weeks that it was injected and then they waited. And then another group was eight weeks where we injected, waited eight weeks, brought them down and are now analyzing the tissues. And so what we saw in the four week arm was really encouraging. Um, what we saw was improvement in, in dystrophin production in the uh, skeletal muscle. So that's like your arms, your legs, your, your diaphragm. Um, but most impressively, what we saw is a significant robust increase in dystrophin in the heart. And um, for those of you that may not be familiar, uh, the heart is, is, is obviously a vital organ, but the heart is generally what goes last. And so if we can, if we can improve the heart, that's fantastic. And so that's what we saw signs of in the four-week arm. The, uh, the eight-week arm is still being analyzed, um, actually, probably as we speak now. And this will, the, the, the positive sign so far from this gives us the confidence to say, okay, let's start the production of the human-grade therapeutic. Let's uh, start this. Start to plan for this farm talk study that's at the bottom of the screen there. Um, and ultimately, what that'll tell us is again, is a triple check on efficacy. We've done cell lines, we've done mice, small groups of mice. Um, this farm talks will be a bigger group of mice. Give us that triple check and prove that therapeutic safe because that's what the FDA above all cares is: is it safe? And that's what we above care. Um, some, some additional recent good news is uh, we have a second patient. Uh, we have a number of, of patients now, but our, uh, well, 10 actually. Um, but our second patient uh, started, uh, I think, eight or 12 months after, after we started with my brother. And um, we did the same thing. We did a muscle biopsy. Uh, we created a number of constructs, which you'll see on the next slide. This patient, in this case, had a duplication. So whereas my brother has the inactivating mutation, given the, given the exon 1 deletion and the muscle isoform, the rest of the engine's intact, the starter's not. This patient has a duplication, meaning exons 20 to 25 are repeated. And so if you think about this like a, like a, like a cookbook, you know, imagine you're baking a cake and it's saying, put the eggs, you know, mix it, uh, bake it. And then it's saying, put the eggs, mix it again. And so that, that, that doesn't make sense in reality and it doesn't make sense on a genetic level either. And so what you get is, is a malfunction in the gene, um, a malfunction in the blueprint that, that, the, that the, uh, the, the ribosomes and the RNA are reading from. And so what we've done uh, or what we theorize to do is how can we knock that out? How can we take that duplication, use CRISPR to cut it right out to allow the rest of the gene to read through? So you can see patient transcript and what we're aiming for. Um, this slide's pretty, it's a little complex, the next one, but I'm gonna try and get through it um, as easily as possible. But so basically we, we designed a, a series of different drugs. You can see them uh, uh, three through eight on the bottom there are different constructs. Um, and what we've done is we've introduced them into the patient cell line. So uh, I'm going to try and simplify this, uh, but it's quite complex. Uh, line one is just a control. Uh, line two is the untreated patient. And you can see in that red box, that darker darker spot is um, an, a, an overabundance of base pairs, meaning too many base pairs, meaning a duplication. So how can we take it out to restore more normal levels of, of not only the base pairs, but also of, of dystrophin production? And so it appears as though our, our, our construct number eight there um, is the one that that does exactly that. It's able to remove the duplication and results in in a healthy band of, uh, of dystrophin production. And so we're really excited about this. This was done in a human uh, cell line um, of the duplication. So there's still a lot of work to go here, but but promising early results. Um, so we're, as I mentioned, we're using an AAV9 to deliver the custom uh, therapy. Um, AAVs are basically the FedEx truck of genetic uh, therapeutics. They are meant to get the, uh, plasmid, what goes in the, in, in the AAV, the package, uh, to the delivery point. So in our case, it's uh, Duchenne's tough because muscles for 40% of your body and it goes from everywhere from, you know, your eyes, uh, your eyebrows down to your toes. And so um, we needed we needed a vehicle that would effectively deliver this cargo throughout the body. And so, uh, 
you know, you see a lot of these gene therapies for the eye or for the liver. Um, those are generally more privileged organs because the eye has a, has a more limited immune system and obviously very easy to get to. Um, and, and the liver is, is, uh, and kidneys are, are filters. And so things tend to gravitate, uh, towards those organs. Um, whereas muscle, it, it's, it's, it's all over your body. So, um, some of the risks of AAV, uh, I think to get across, you know, you can you can read there for yourself. Um, you know, is there an immune response? It's a foreign virus that enters the body, and so if there are antibodies to it, uh, you'll get an immune response to it. The body will attack it and think it's a foreign entity. Um, the payload and the the amount of AAV delivered is high, and so it's very important to make sure that there aren't a significant level of what's called neutralizing antibodies that the patient has beforehand, else risk a, a significant uh, immune response. Um, another risk is inserting the gene into the wrong area. You know, this is looking at and saying, did we put it in in the right uh, where it was supposed to go? Did the guide RNA line up uh, and go to where we wanted them to go to? Uh, did we deliver it to the right cells? We do something called biodistribution studies. Uh, if you're signed up for our newsletter, uh, in our last newsletter sent out yesterday, uh, we we showed our one of our slides of the biodistribution and that this drug is uh, this uh, construct AAV muscle promoter. And what's called the green fluorescent protein it's like tracing um does it get to muscle does it have a favorite for muscle uh, or does it just all go to the kidney does it all go to the, the, the liver things we don't want to see and so we're, we're fortunate to have seen that um our aav this aav9 and the muscle specific promoter do have an affinity for muscle that's a good sign um and then lastly is the question of how long does it last this is an open question that i don't that that society hasn't advanced far enough yet to to know the answer to but how long does this last and 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 what happens afterwards um these are very challenging questions and right now you can't redose aav remember it's a virus and once you're exposed to the virus uh you develop the immunities to it and so um how do we how do we advance past that is a is a question that the the science community is dealing with with now uh, but we're in the early stages i think um i think things um you know aav took 20 30 years to get to where it is now it's a long development cycle. However, we're not starting from scratch with the next generation of delivery vessels. Uh, AAV will, the next generation will stand on the shoulders of AAV and everything we've learned there. And so um, it becomes a it becomes a virtuous cycle to the more we accomplish, the more we learn, we as a society, not we as in just care or disease, um, we're able to take advantage of that moving forward and hopefully uh, move more effective treatments quicker to patients. Let me stop here and see if there's any questions. That's right. This is a biologic. That's correct. Yep. Seabird, cedar. Yep. We're going to cedar, not seabird, because we're a biologic. How does someone get in a testing process and how are costs paid? Um, not sure what you mean by testing process. Um, if you, like I mentioned, I'm not sure if you were here earlier, Colette, but the, 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 uh, it's not so much a testing process um, as it is if you're talking about whole genome sequencing or uh, exome sequencing, that's something that, that you and your doctor can talk about. Um, if you're talking about neutralizing antibody tests, um, that's again something that you and your doctor can, can have a conversation about. Generally, clinical trials don't, um, don't uh, screen uh, patients for neutralizing antibodies until they're already accept, uh, until you know uh, they're establishing baseline. It's it's called a screening visit where you'll be tested. If it's an AAV mediated drug, um, you'll be tested to see okay do, does this patient have significant antibodies or not, um, and how are costs paid. So if if it's a if it's a traditionally run pharmaceutical drug, um, the company is responsible for paying those, um, not uh, not the individual generally. So we function a little bit differently. Um, at, I can get into how we work in a bit, but um, that's that's generally how um, uh, how that works. Uh, great news, thank you. How will cure disease avoid the same pitfalls seen in the CRISPR twins in China? Do you see any political resistance? That's a good question. You know, I, I don't get too wrapped up in the ethics um, of it. Uh, I believe, I'm not super familiar with the case, but I believe the researcher did it without permission, um, and so that that's that's just not acceptable. Um, it's it's absolutely critical that that you get you know, whether you're the biggest company, drug company in the world, or you're, or you're a small biotech, um, it's absolutely critical that you get the FDA's approval, that you work with them, that you get their permission to, to do this, because uh, we're at a delicate point in society where, where we don't want rogue actors to go out and do things that, that aren't okay. Uh, we want everyone to follow the, the regulatory guidelines um, that, that are prescribed by the FDA to work with 
to work with uh, proper clinicians and researchers um, because that that type of that type of activity is just not okay and, and shouldn't be condoned anywhere. Uh, is this gene therapy or CRISPR gene editing? So gene therapy is kind of a basket term. Um, gene therapy just means, uh, well, generally gene therapy means uh, either parts or a whole gene delivered to an individual. Um, so we're delivering machinery to edit a genome. So uh, it, sometimes people also mean gene therapy by things delivered with AAV too. So it, it's, a, it's a bit of a somewhat nebulous term, but um, what we're doing is we're using CRISPR delivered with an AAV9 to insert machinery into an individual's genome to make edits that will that will benefit them as individuals. Um, but, 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 but my son's doctor wants to do a mouse model. However, quite costly. Any other options? Um, have to know more. It's kind of uh, a, a bit of a bit of a broad question, Sherry. But happy to happy to take it offline. Um, generally, mouse models are just good experimental organisms that we can put a drug into and see how it works. Um, uh, to create them, we, we are creating some mouse models that are patient specific in the background. Um, and it is expensive. It does take a long time. Um, and, and for, for depending on the mutation, it may or may not be possible to create a mouse model. Generally, it's easier, ironically, to create a mouse model of an individual with a deletion. Uh, than a duplication because it's hard to insert that genetic duplication into the mouse, whereas it's easy to go into that mouse and then knock out that exon uh, to create the mouse model. So again, uh, you know, do do I mean talk with your doctor for sure, but uh, not not quite clear why why you'd want to do that. The title of the screen confused me because it's a genetic therapy, um, right? So genetic therapy, we're we're trying to we're trying to modify the genome, I think. So in our case, um, in the AAV, in the uh, microdystrophin example, I may have touched on, they're delivering a piece of of the dystrophin gene into the individual. Uh, the goal is obviously to deliver the whole uh, gene, but AAV has a capacity size. So um, I hope that clears that up. Uh, will this work for intra-exon point mutations, base pair deletions? Um, it kind of depends, uh, Mark, uh, on, on, on where it is. So um, uh, if it's at the beginning of the gene, it's obviously, uh, that's much more complicated. You wouldn't want to delete anything out in the beginning if, if you're trying to skip over it because you can't skip over something that never starts. Um, if it's later in the gene, uh, generally there's, there's uh, at least for dystrophin, there's a nice graphic of how it all fits together. Um, and, and so what you want to do is, you know, all the ends need to line up. So, you know, the ends will be, uh, I don't have a great graphic. Uh, I wonder if I can draw on this here. Let me, let me try this. Turn whiteboard on. Okay. I'm going to do a live experiment here. So the way this generally fits together is something like that. They're like building blocks. Oh man, I'm going to try and draw this and mess it up so bad. And so what I was trying to draw there is is not particularly well done, but um, it's 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 supposed to be a triangle. On um, the tip of a triangle, and then the tip of the triangle fits fits into the adjacent piece. And so, um, you know, if your mutation, I wish I could draw better. Is right there, for instance. And I'm oversimplifying this just for the sake of saving me from drawing on the screen. Um, you know, if, if this exon's mutated, you see these two ends don't fit together, right? The triangle doesn't fit into the into this into the rectangle. And so, one strategy could be to say, okay, well, instead of trying to reinsert this piece, let's just knock out this piece, and that way the two ends fit together. You see, they come together like bookends. And so that's that's one strategy. So it really does depend on. Um, on where the mutation is and sort of what it looks like. And that's that's generally for, for multiple diseases, not just Duchenne. Um, uh, genes are made up of exons and, and it's how they fit together that enables that read through or, or lack of thereof read through. Um, so let me see if I can clear this. Uh, turn this off now. Oh, there we go, okay. Um, okay, so I'm gonna keep moving on. Thanks for the questions. Really good questions. Just gotta get this to my other screen. Um, so right now, this is this is uh, what what Cure Disease is looking at right now. So our, our first patient is our proof of concept patient, uh, my brother. And so this has been never done before. And so we so our first question was, could we do it? Um, so far, it's looking it's looking more positive. We're not we're not there yet, but we are making progress. Um, and so the infrastructure. Going back to that first, uh, one of the first slides that showed 
our different collaborators with us in the center. One of the hardest parts of this was putting all those collaborators in place, establishing infrastructure. Where do we take the cell line? Who develops the therapeutic? Who tests the therapeutic? Uh, who, who produces the human grade AAV? Who produces the human grade plasmid? Uh, who does the clinical trial? Get them all talked together. Um, so that infrastructure is now in place. And so that will benefit every other patient that comes afterwards. Terry's, uh, well, uh, he's certainly willing, but uh, so Terry's forging the path with what he's doing here um, and the risk that he's taking. Uh, and that's really at the benefit for our, for our other cohorts. We call it cohort zero and cohort number one. They're five and five patients each. I'll do Shen. Um, cohort zero and cohort one both have a limb girdle patient as well. Um, and so the infrastructure that's been built, our know-how, our process, our, our everything that's gone into the first one is starting to benefit. You saw the second patient there with the upregulation of, of removing the duplication. Um, that, that infrastructure there will now benefit all the other patients that come afterwards. And so what we want to do and what we're looking at now is how do we scale this? How do we reach more people? How do we help more people, um, especially those that um, you know, have progressed into the disease, especially those that don't have access to clinical trials? Um, those are the individuals that we don't want to leave behind. And we're, we're, we're working as hard as we can um, tirelessly to, to get this going and to move this forward. Um, and so just, just a quick glimpse into, into what we've got going on. Uh, most, uh, there are, uh, there's a couple brothers involved. So generally brothers have the same mutation. Um, these these uh, mutations are generally all rare mutations as well. Um, you saw one of the duplications, you saw the inactivating mutation. So again, trying to go after and help individuals that um, don't have ex access and, and have gotten this message of, you know, you have to go home and love them. Um, that, that's just not right. Uh, again, if there's any questions, you know, feel free to do ask them. You guys have been doing a great job so far. Keep it up. Uh, well, don't know if I'll be able to answer them all, but if I can't, I uh, will certainly find the answer for you. Um, and so, as I mentioned, you know, this proof of concept, we want to expand to other patients lacking a therapy. We want to expand to other individuals who have sort of been left out of traditional drug development. Um, this slide is, is, is a heavy slide, but basically it says there's a lot of patients and there's a lot of different mutations. And this is DMD specifically. And so for this slide, there's 6,999 other slides that look just like this that say, what's the distribution of mutations and who isn't in what's called a hotspot mutation, sort of these bars where it's low are, 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 are more rare mutations versus the higher bars, which have a higher frequency. You know, we see exon 51, exon 53, exon 45. Um, these are more common mutations, at least in the Duchenne, uh, in, the, in the case of Duchenne. Other, other diseases, other genes um, will have different, uh, different, different plots, of course. And, and some diseases actually like ALS are, are, are multi-genetic uh, and cause. So they'll have multiple genes that don't work that results in, in an ALS mutation, which is super, super complicated. Um, once a I think this slide is, is, is a really encouraging slide. It, it, we've seen in the last, uh, what's, what's the earliest date on this? 2019, you know, we've seen in the last two or three years, this rise in looking at how do we, how do we challenge the status quo? How do we challenge the existing paradigm of doing new things? You know, I've got a quote on there from, from Dr. Tim Yu there on the bottom. Um, and, and, and he said it well, he said, you know, the N of one serves as a basis uh, for launching additional studies. There weren't treatment, or there weren't, um, uh, you know, there, there weren't, uh, you know, uh, killer side effects um, in this case. And so, uh, you know, with, with, the, with uh, the other comments from, from Dr. Woodcock and Dr. Gottlieb, um, you know, we're starting to see this rise in gene therapies. I think the last number was that there's over 500 INDs um, with the FDA for different genetic therapies. Um, again, those, you know, delivered by an AAV with, with either the machinery or the fragment or the whole gene being delivered to the individual. Um, so, so it's, it's, it's an interesting time to take advantage of this, of this, um, uh, evolution in thinking from the regulatory agencies. And so far, you know, all, all signs point to that. The, the thinking is positive and, and with technologies that are, are super new, that we are on the cutting edge of therapy, that, that the FDA, at least I look at the FDA as a partner and saying, okay, we're doing our best to try to do as many experiments that will illuminate the darkness that is not yet the known. Um, and the FDA doesn't know everything either. And so it's a conversation. And so that, that open dialogue, that open collaboration, again, is something that's helping to fuel what we're seeing here with, with the rise of these gene therapies.
And so, uh, you know, cure a disease again is, is what we're trying to do is develop these customized therapeutics for those who have been overlooked. We're, take, we're bringing researchers together to take advantage of that group wisdom to get rid of those traditional bottlenecks, those traditional silos that hamper progress. Uh, what works in a mouse doesn't always work in a human as we've seen from multiple times. And so how can we test things on human cell lines that is actually going the human of? Um, how can we think differently to try and uh, fix that 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 long cycle to develop drugs um, and so just a, a couple uh, I guess and a statistic on the side there we, we partner with six or seven different institutions um, and we try to involve the families um, I think a frustration that at least I and my family have had um, in the past is uh, drug development and and the clinical trial process is something like a black box you don't know what's going to happen you don't know if the trial will just get canceled um, and that and that's really challenging and, and some of this is informed by um, the economics of the situation and, and shareholder value. And so, um, again, that's neither good nor bad, but the frustration that we feel is a bad thing. And so how can we fix that in this new model that we're creating, right? If we can make it, then why don't we make it right? And we have that chance to do that now. <clears throat> Uh, again, towards the towards the transparency side of things, um, uh, transparent about where where the cost breakdown is. I think you know what we're seeing is it costs about two two and a half million bucks to develop uh, a customized therapeutic from the ground up. Um, we're learning. We're we're hoping that cost goes down uh, as we start to take advantage of things like you know being able to cross reference previous studies, um, being able to do more in vitro work. We hope to, in vitro meaning in a dish. Um, we we anticipate that cost falling. Um, and, and a lot of the cost is driven by the production of the therapeutic itself, um, the AAV and the plasmid. Um, there is such high quality and purity that it's very expensive to do. Um, but we want to make sure that we're transparent with people and we want to make sure that, that people know where our costs and what our costs are. And, you know, we're working to, to, to raise this money. You know, it's our supporters who help to, to make this happen. It's our partnerships. It's our donors. Um, it's, it's folks who like us on, on Facebook and things like that that we're able to move the needle on that. Um, and what we, what the, again, the vision, um, the vision of what we want to do is we want to be able to get insurance reimbursement from this. Um, the strategy that we're taking with the first one is, is the strategy of can we get hospitalization costs reimbursed? Um, hospitalization costs are very familiar to insurance companies. And so that's, that's at least a ground on which the payers, the insurance companies are already familiar. And how can we keep the conversation going so that we can get the ex a more expensive part of the therapeutic reimbursed, that production that you saw on the last slide? Um, how can we get that covered? Now, insurance is never going to cover research. It's never going to cover academic lab work. Um, but if we can get pieces of this covered by different people, then we can really scale up and make this happen. And so we want to use sort of the first wave of these custom drugs to, to do exactly that, to convince the payers that, that this uh, actually economically makes sense for them, that over the lifespan of an individual with a, a disease like Duchenne, they'll spend around you know, eight, seven million dollars. And so if for two million dollars, we can help to alleviate a significant percentage of those costs down the road, well, then it makes economic sense. And if it makes economic sense, then, then it's much more likely to happen. So that's what we're trying to drive for um, is, is that reimbursement um, so, that, so that folks um, don't have to throw as many bake sales at the end of the day. But until then, that's, that's exactly what we're doing and that's exactly what we'll do. Um, a little bit about our, this is, our, this is a, a fragment of our, our technical team, um, of our scientists. Um, so we have uh, somebody uh, asked a question of UCLA, there's Stan, there's Richard. Um, we've got folks from UMass with Charlie uh, on the left and then Brenda Wong, who's one of the leading clinicians in the field. Um, we've got uh, uh, luminaries in the field, uh, again, with Stan and Charlie, but also Dr. Lou Kunkel um, from Boston Children's Hospital. Again, taking advantage of this group wisdom to be able to say, okay, have you done this, uh, an experiment like this in the past? Or have you designed a study like this in the past and how does it look? Um, so we don't have to run into those same bottlenecks, those same roadblocks that others have run into in the past. Um, and our rock star team at Yale with uh, Karen and, and Monkel, uh, just a subset of the lab, um, are really driving the, the discovery side of this, of actually building the construct and the therapeutic. And we're really fortunate to have some, some the, the, the support of some really great individuals within the industry. Uh, Richard Snyder, who was one of the, one of the early founders of Brammer Bio, uh, which was uh, then acquired. Um, Michelle Berg over at Aldebaran. And uh, Terry Flott, who some of you may know as the dean of the University of Massachusetts Medical School. 
And, and then of course, Lauren Black, who, who's worked with Tim Yu in, in pioneering one of the first custom genetic therapies um, has really, really opened up a lot of opportunity for the field in general. So just a subset, but, but wanted, to, wanted to put some faces to all the work that's going on behind this. Uh, so long term, uh, the, the vision, uh, where, do, where do we want to go? So, so we want to uh, take our current cohorts, develop uh, customized therapeutics for them uh, that successfully work and, and treat them and, and trial this platform to not just one individual, but five individuals and then 10 individuals and more and more and more um, within you know, the next few years. And, and really what we want to do is we want to be able to generalize this process so that it can become a segmented ve a vehicle into which we can insert different uh, academic discovery researchers. So instead of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, how can we plug in an, uh, 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 an academic that works on cystic fibrosis into this process that's already been established downstream? Um, working with payers again to get reimbursement uh, accomplished and working with the FDA to keep the conversation going of how do we create a sustainable path for individualized clinical trials and drugs um, and, and some con early conversations that the FDA is thinking about this. Um, Steeter, as, uh, as Robert mentioned earlier, is the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research and uh, Cedar uh, is, is planning to issue guidelines uh, that will support the individualization of drug development. It, it lays out a roadmap for what's expected. CBER will, will follow and do the same, uh, I believe, afterwards, um, or would assume afterwards. So, so just again, the vision of where we want to go. We want to scale this. We want to get insurance reimbursement so it's sustainable. Uh, we want to work with payers to, or regulators to make sure that uh, the dialogue is open and the collaboration is working, that every, every group is feeling like they're seeing the right things that they want to see. Um, and our, our board is supportive uh, of this. You know, we, we've got a great, uh, a, a great board. Um, we're, we're, you know, the board is constructed of different individuals from different backgrounds. I won't spend too much time on this, but you know, if you're you're interested, more more than welcome to to reach out. Um, we support our we our board supports us in a lot of our fundraising activities that we do. So I'll just wrap up here. Uh, what time is it? Oh, wow, it's already eight o'clock. Um, I'll just wrap up. You know, if you're interested, I, I encourage you to reach out and learn more. Um, right now, we're focused on Duchenne, but the goal is to expand to other diseases and to teach other academics and, and families how can we spread this to, to different diseases, right? We, we don't want to be the limiting factor in customized therapeutics. Um, we want to build this, show this can work, get insurance reimbursement, and teach others how they can uh, partner with academics to then uh, utilize this infrastructure to, to develop therapeutics for their loved ones as well. So, so reach out. Our, our website is there. Uh, follow us on social media. Our handles are all at Cure Rare Disease. Um, and, you know, if you're especially passionate, you know, uh, you know, in hosting a fundraiser or joining a committee, encourage that as well. The big thing about this is that it's entirely grassroots. Um, I'd love to have a Bill Gates behind us, but we don't yet have a Bill Gates behind us. And so um, that's both a blessing and a curse in that over 250,000 people have donated to make this Cure Rare Disease vision ever more a reality. And so whether you're an individual who's interested um, a, a company who, who's interested in partnering with a, with a nonprofit that's trying to change the paradigm, um, or, or, or you know of individuals who are touched. You know, I think the big the big takeaway here is is to to reach out, to to share, um, and 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 you know don't don't be shy. So I'll wrap up there. Um, let me flip back now and see if there's any questions. If you'd like to reach out, there's there's my email. Um, what do we got? Here? I think you just answered that. Uh, bu, 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 bu. Laura McGlynn, do any of your patients have larger middles and deletions? My son's missing 50, 45 to 52. Uh, yeah, one of our patients has a 45 to 50 deletion. So, so that is a, a similar zone. Um, so yeah, that's, that's and, and the idea is that, um, you know, customized therapeutics are kind of interesting because um, it's, it's likely that, that more than one individual has the same mutation. Now, hotspot mutation—that's that's much, you know, much much more likely. But even even a single individual with a single disease that's thought to be the only one in the world is likely not the only one in the world. And so it begs the question: you know, if it works on one, can we easily modify it to another? And that's another area where we can start to look at bringing costs down um, and, and moving forward. So yeah, absolutely. And we've talked a couple of times, but uh, you know, happy to happy to keep the conversation going, uh, Laura. Uh, and appreciate the compliment as well. Um, so if, if there's any more questions, maybe I'll just wait uh, around for a few minutes, but um, you know, encourage, encourage folks to, to reach out, to, to get involved. 
um, you know, we're just trying to do something different. We're trying to challenge the, the existing paradigm to add another tool into the toolkit of humanity to fight these really awful diseases. Um, and so far, so good. Um, and, and hopefully uh, in a few months, we will be, um, we'll be dosing our first patient. How about polyge mutations? I, Colette, I'm not really sure what a polyge, oh, polyge, uh, polygenetic, you mean? Like multiple genes? I'll just wait here while you type. <clears throat> and if there's any other questions, again, you know, feel free. Like I said, I might not know all the answers, but uh, if, if I don't, I certainly will find the answers. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, again, Colette, not, not entirely sure. Um, if, if you do mean polygenetic right now, right now we're primarily, we're really working on monogenetic, so like Duchenne, um, diseases like that. Um, you know, in the future, certainly have aspirations to go after polygenetic diseases. Um, that's a that's 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 a complicated, uh, more complicated field for sure. So, you know, again, trying to prove out the process here um, uh, with with a monogenic monogenic disease, um, then starting to expand outward. And really, that expansion is a function of is a function of awareness, of a function of fundraising and capacity. So, um, we're 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 trying our hardest to to keep pushing out on that. So. All right, really, really appreciate everybody's uh, uh, presence here. Again, you know, if there's questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, check out our website. Um, our social media is at Cure Rare Disease, um, and uh, be on the lookout. Uh, we should be in the Boston Globe on July, uh, early July, it should be. So, really appreciate the time, and I uh, hope everybody has a wonderful evening. Uh, and this will be recorded on our website as well. So, if you miss parts, um, you can go back and, and should be able to view it as well. Thank you. <laughs>